Good morning and welcome to Grace Presbyterian Church on Christ the King Sunday. Even though it's often forgotten at this time of year, the church has long used this particular Sunday to preview the season of Advent. When we prepare our hearts for Christmas with a celebration of Christ's kingship, his reign and his rule But the remarkable thing about Christ's kingship in our broken world is that he does not choose to force God's rule upon us. Instead, he gives us a choice to respond to grace or not. According to all four Gospels, most faith leaders in Jesus' day made the wrong choice. They opposed Christ from the start. But one remarkable leader... A man named John the Baptist made the right choice. Even though he had thousands of ardent fans completely devoted to himself, he chose to take the focus of those fans from himself to Jesus. He must increase. I must decrease. And strangely enough, he said all that with joy. I'll be saying much more about that particular episode a little bit later in our service today, but for now I invite you to join me in worshiping the one of whom John spoke, our Messiah, our Savior, our King. Would you please stand and join me in the call to worship? I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. Thank you. 
as I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown, good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sisters, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, sisters, let's go down, down to the river to as I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, brothers, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, brothers, let's go down, down to the river to pray. As I went to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown, good Lord, show me the way. Oh, mothers, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, mothers, let's go down, down to the river to pray. As I went down to the river to pray, Studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown? Good Lord, show me the way. The robe and crown, good Lord, show me the way. Prophets 
to a flesh and came the word from the throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dark. morning that can help me hold some things because I do not have enough hands. Victoria, you want to hold something? Hunter and Kate? All right, come on up. Okay, so I was thinking this week, one of my very favorite Bible verses goes like this. It says, for God so loved the world. And I'm sure we've all heard that one before. It's a very popular Bible verse. It's John 3, 16. Okay, and so I was thinking about that verse and wondering about how great God's love really is and how we could measure it. And so I think some of us are getting some ideas, um, but I want to ask you some questions first. So first, this week we had Thanksgiving, right? Who made things for Thanksgiving? Did anybody help in the kitchen? Okay, sometimes we measure things for ingredients. Like if we were baking cookies, what of these three things, for everybody out there that couldn't see, we have a measuring cup, a watch, and a tape measure. What could we use to measure ingredients? What do you guys think? Bryce, what do you think? What's up here? Hunter, come stand on this side. Yeah, the measuring cup. Hold that up nice and high. Okay, do you think that we could measure God's love with a measuring cup? I see some people shaking their heads. No, well, let's think for a second. The Bible says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. My cup runneth over. Well, hold on a second. If my cup is running over, do I have enough space to measure God's love? No, okay, so the measuring cup won't work. So, Kate, why don't you go ahead and have a seat? (laughs) Okay, so the measuring cup wouldn't work, right? God's love is too big for the measuring cup. Let's see. Next, let's think if we were building something. What might we use to build something? Do you think we'd use a tape measure or a watch? The tape measure. And so, Hunter, do you think that that tape measure, let's listen to what the Bible says. Do you think that if we had, let's see, our Bible verse is, God's love is higher than the heavens, Do you think that tape measure could measure higher than the heavens? No, I don't think so. God's love is too big for the tape measure. You know, I don't even think that one would make it higher than the heavens. So Hunter, why don't you have a seat? All right, we have one left. What's left? A watch. Okay, so let's see. We use a watch to measure what? time, right? Well, the Bible says that God's love will last from everlasting to everlasting. That's a really long time, right? That's like forever. Do you think that my watch can measure forever? Oh, he thinks maybe. You think the battery is going to last that long? Is the battery going to last that long? Probably not, right? I don't even think that the watch can measure God's love. Do you? No, all right, so Victoria, go ahead and have a seat. So we had all of these things that we used to measure things. Could we measure God's love? 
No, why not? It's too big to measure, right? So, for God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Last time I was up here, we talked about that one, right? So, none of these things can measure a love like that, right? We can't. We don't need to measure it to know how much God loves us. Hunter, can we put it away? We don't want to hit anybody with it. Thank you. (laughs) So, it's too big. We can't measure it. And we don't need to because we can feel God's love, right? And so we're going to pray in just a second. But I, my prayer for you guys is that we experience God's love, especially in this upcoming season for Advent. Can we pray together? All right, let's bow our heads. All right. Dear God, we thank you for your love. Please help us to understand how wide, how long, how high, and how deep your love really is. May we experience it, even though it is so great that we will never fully understand it. Thank you for giving us a love so great that you gave your one and only son so that we could have eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, let's go ahead and go to children's time. Will you take my things with us to our classroom? Thank you. Trusting in the promise of grace, let us tell the whole truth about ourselves and ask for God's mercy so our lives can be made new. Please stand and join me in the prayer of confession. Heavenly Father and gracious King, we confess that we are sometimes disenchanted children and rebellious subjects. We live as the kingdom of justice dream, or perhaps a good idea. Yet our lives will end as quickly as dreams, while your reign will last forever. So open our eyes to see the many signs of your leadership in this changing world, and open our hearts to follow in the path you set for us. For it is Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Rejoice and be glad. Our God is full of mercy slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. we praise God is for the fellowship of those around us. Why don't you take a moment now to greet them and extend the peace of Christ to them. as we do gather to praise God on this Thanksgiving weekend, it's also important to plan ahead for the weeks to come 
And lots of things are happening in the weeks to come. First, right after church today, you're, reminded, you're invited to remain here in the building for the Hanging of the Greens, our annual decoration party here at the church. As in years past, we will actually serve fellowship treats out that window. You won't have to go outside because we're all going to be decorating here in church, at least all those who have the energy and time to do so. We're going to be listening to carols, and we're going to end this particular celebration in a different way that Zach will describe in a few minutes. Then next weekend, we'll continue the celebration of Christ's coming with the annual Christmas luncheon of our church. Not only will we share great food, we're also going to have some great games together, seasonally appropriate, supported by the Fellowship Committee of the Church. That begins next Saturday, December 2nd at 1130 a.m. Then at 4 p.m. on Friday of the following weekend, that's December 8th, you're invited to participate in another grace tradition, community Christmas caroling. And a variety of retirement homes throughout our area we'll begin by visiting Atria at 4 o'clock, then Fountain Glen, then Harveston, before wrapping it all up with a shared meal together. We usually have a couple of elves show up for this occasion, along with several Santa hats, and we always have fun together. Finally, on Christmas Eve, this year, since it falls on a Sunday, we're going to have two very different services that day. Our morning service will feature a children's Christmas story with all sorts of charming characters in costume. It's called Room for a Little One, and lots of little children will be part of it. In fact, if you know some kids who aren't currently active in our church, get in touch with us quick. We'll work them in. It's always fun to do. And it's always charming to see how that turns out in the end. The evening service at 4 o'clock on Christmas Eve will be our traditional service of lessons and carols involving candlelight, choir, handbells, and communion. But this year, we'll also add a bit of contemporary music to give it a slightly different flair. It's going to be such a beautiful service, and it's also such a wonderful chance for you to invite extended family and friends to come with you to the church. Moving on to prayer request, uh, I'm sorry to report that several members of our church are battling cancer in one form or another. Some are listed in the bulletin, some not. Uh, several members of our church are also undergoing tests to diagnose whatever might be ailing them at this point, and all of them would appreciate your prayers. I'm happy to report that several members of the church are recuperating well from surgery, and several members of the church have recently been declared cancer-free. That's always exciting. But I hope you'll continue to pray for them because the future is never quite sure there. In addition to those concerns, I hope you'll pray for those uh, in our church who are grieving the loss of a loved one in this holiday season. Christmas can be challenging for them. I also hope you'll pray for those who are struggling to manage recurring pain in some form or another. Looking outside our fellowship, I hope that you will intercede for those dealing with problems much bigger than we typically face, especially those recuperating from the atrocities of war. I also hope you'll pray for those who have the power to end it. Finally, I hope you'll pray for us, each one of us, that we might be a source of healing, hope, and strength to those who need it most. We do ask it always in the name of him who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of Christ. Amen.
From everything we can tell, the central character in this morning's Bible text depended on that power from the moment of his birth until his dying day. His name was John the Baptist, and in the era when Christ lived, several thousand people flocked to hear him. But he didn't talk about the things that tend to fill auditoriums today. His message wasn't about positive thinking. Nor was it gripping stories of perseverance or well-trod steps to success. Instead, he talked about sin. Plain old ugly sin. And he directed them to repent. He was also pretty courageous in calling out sins from people in power including Roman soldiers, even Jewish kings. He called them out clearly. He was fearless in that sense. So fearless that thousands of people flocked to hear him. They couldn't wait to hear what John said next. But one thing that John said to these adoring crowds was puzzling to them. When told about Jesus and the crowds who followed him, John didn't even try to compete. He didn't say, I'm just as good as him. I'm the best preacher in our era. I'm the best leader in the church. Didn't do any of that. Instead, he simply said, he must increase. I must decrease. And the weirdest thing of all is that he said that with a sense of joy. His message is, comes to us from the third chapter of John's Gospel, beginning with verse 11. I call it downsizing, and invite you to listen now for the meaning of his words to us today. Then Jesus and his disciples went into the land of Judea, where he stayed and baptized with them. John was also baptizing at Enon near Salem, because many came out to see him, and there was a lot of water there. This was before John was imprisoned. But an argument developed between John's disciples and a certain Jew about rituals of purification. So they came to John and said, Rabbi, the one who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one whom you bore witness, he is now baptizing, and everyone is going out to him. John answered, each person may receive only what is given to him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Christ. Instead, I have been appointed to go before him. The bride belongs to the groom, the friend of the groom, the one who stands and listens for him, rejoices at the sound of his voice. That joy is mine, and my joy is now complete. He must become greater, I must become less. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Just to put this morning's text in perspective, I'd like for you to imagine an interview with a celebrity, almost any celebrity, in which that person says, you know, she's the better singer. He's the better leader. She's the better performer in our day. I've probably watched hundreds of celebrity interviews in the last 30 years. I can't remember one where that was said. They might acknowledge other artists, their influence, and so on. But in almost every case, it comes back to number one. 
That's how this artist blessed me, how that leader shaped me, how that teacher enabled me to excel. And that's why this morning's text is so extreme. John was no slacker, no minor force in history. Christian disciples encountered followers of John several thousand miles from Judea, several decades after he had passed. That's how widespread his influence became. But in this morning's text, He's completely deferential. He doesn't say, oh, yeah, Jesus, he's okay. And yeah, yeah, Jesus had some influence on my preaching style. Instead, he simply says, he must be bigger. He must be greater. I must become less. And he says all that with joy. Not fatalism, negativism, joy. Two reasons are given in this text. First, he describes himself as a forerunner and a witness to the Lord. John fulfilled that role quite well. And I think he knew it. Second, when talking about Jesus, he describes himself as a friend of the groom. You might even say Christ's best man. That's such a fascinating image. When going to a wedding in our day, we're taught to focus on the bride, actually show the whole wedding party to do that. From the minute she enters the building to the minute she leaves, look at the bride. Wherever she is, that's the thing you're supposed to do. But in the ancient world, it was different because weddings were not typically held in a church. They were held in the bride's home. And the highlight of the evening is when the groom appeared. Typically on horseback, typically wearing fine robes. That's what everyone awaited with great eagerness and joy. Once the groom appeared, then things could get started. Then they had a feast together. Then they spent the night together. Then the bride left her home with the groom to begin a new life together. And that's the picture John had in mind when describing himself in this text. Yes, he's in the wedding party, and weddings are always fun. He plays a vital role. But he does not play the central role. That role was reserved for the groom. It does say John rejoices. He's actually thrilled to hear the bridegroom's voice. But John clearly has no plans to take the bride away. Nor does John plan to turn the focus on himself. Instead, he turns our eyes to Jesus. Everyone in the room, you look to him. Because that's finally what this wedding is about. But what does that mean for us, for you and me today? I suggest two things. First, in our world as in his, the witness of Christ must become greater. In our day and time, there's so much hunger for it. Yes, of course, it's true that many folks are alienated from the church. But I've rarely met anyone who was actually alienated from Jesus. What he said, what he did, what that means. Instead, they hunger for Christ's compassion. They long for understanding. They pray that someone figures out how to resolve differences as Christ taught us. Without violence or hate, young people in particular truly long to see all that. Based on 200 years of history, Christ is our greatest hope to meet that need. But you've got to follow him. You've got to do the things he said. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Turn the other cheek. If we really did that, if every 
Christian did that. Can you imagine how very different this world would be? It's amazing. Of course, usually we don't. The church has long acknowledged that. Usually we fall short in some way. But that's actually why the Christian church picked this season the season between Thanksgiving and Christmas, to focus a bit on ourselves. What are you doing to make Jesus' mission greater? What does that really take? When it comes to your level of devotion, do you live as Jesus taught? Or not. When it comes to your use of money, do you live as Jesus taught or not? When it comes to your forgiveness of someone who did you wrong, badly wrong, Do you live as Jesus taught or not? If not, why not? What needs to change in you for Christ's mission to increase, for his influence to redeem the world around us? That's the first topic that this text invites us to consider. Here's the second. In order for Christ to become greater, some parts of you must become less. Less ego. Less arrogance. Less obsession with your accomplishments and your reputation. Less certainty that your views on politics are exactly right. Because those are the traits that alienate you, both from God and other people in this world. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting that you must smother some part of yourself, becoming something you were never made to be. I'm actually suggesting just the opposite. In order to become the person that Christ has longed for you to be, You need to knock off some rough edges. You need to deal with some character traits that interfere with all of that. Historically, the church has called this process of character development sanctification. And to some extent, it does involve getting less, less self-focused, less self-interested, less self-assured and self-absorbed, less driven to do your thing, regardless of the cost to someone else. John is the great role model of that in this morning's text, setting aside an amazing reputation and several thousand followers for the sake of Christ. And of course, the great irony of John's story is that in doing that, in setting all of that aside, he actually became more famous than he ever would have been. After all, history is full of preachers, fiery, dramatic preachers who led waves of revival, but their names are not in Scripture by and large. John's is because he became the role model for every one of us. When thinking about that a bit, I was reminded of another famous Christian, a man who had more influence on every branch of Christianity for centuries than any Catholic cardinal or pope. His legal name was Giovanni di Pietro di Bernardone, the privileged son of a French nobleman, noblewoman rather, and a rich Italian merchant. But he's best known as Saint Francis. 
Interestingly enough, he never went to seminary, never got ordained, never had the power to say mass in the Roman Catholic Church, never led a papal army, yet no one in that century had more power and more influence than him. It started when he renounced the life of a nobleman in order to rebuild a local church that had fallen into disrepair, made some mistakes on the way, but stuck with it. It climaxed with several thousand friars and several million followers who chose to follow him. But actually, in following him, they had to follow the rule that he created, just one rule. You know what it is? Do what Jesus taught. That was the central rule of his order. You know the Sermon on the Mount? You know all those rules? Just do that. Just do it. Don't, you know, talk about it, discuss it, wonder why it's hard. Just do it. And many people did. First there was an order of men, then there was an order of women. Then there was even a secular order created of Franciscans for those who were already married. He had such amazing influence in the world. But there's really just one reason for it. He set aside all earthly things that most people clamor for and chose to make Christ central, his teachings great, instead. Of course, I'm not St. Francis, nor are you, neither am I John the Baptist, but actually have one thing that they don't. I've got time. I still have time as I live and breathe to do two things. I can make Christ greater, and I can make my ego less. So can you. So can you. The question is, will you? As we prepare our hearts for Christ this year,
hear the good news of the gospel. You may not be John the Baptist. You may not be St. Francis. But you have one thing they do not. Time. Time to make a difference. Time to make Christ greater. Time to make your ego less. Use it. And Christ will be magnified in our day and in the days to come. Amen. Amen.